Hello, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone is keeping well and healthy. I'm Jennifer, the Executive Director of the BMCC. Welcome to BMCC's webinar series on the impact of COVID-19 to businesses. Just want to share with you the topics that we have decided to for the webinar seminars are based on the feedback that you members have given to us through our survey. So today, uh, on behalf of BMCC, we would like to thank Knight Frank uh, for these collaborations. And today's team will be managing issues related to illness in the SME. Okay. Before I pass the mic to the esteemed panelists from Knight Frank, let me just uh, a note to all the panelists, uh, sorry, a note to all the participants. If you would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A function or tap at the bottom of your screens. Do not use the chat function. We will not take questions from the chat function. All questions has to be to the Q&A. So uh, let me just introduce you to the first uh, speaker, James Buckley. James will introduce his team will be speaking today. James is the Executive Director of Capital Markets. So with that, everyone enjoy the session. Let me pass you to James. James, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, and also to the <coughs> British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce uh, for inviting us to speak today at, at this webinar. Um, just very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with Knight Frank, um, we are a global property advisor. We offer the full spectrum of property advice from valuation and advisory agency, both on the commercial and residential sides, uh, property management and, and research. And we've been in Malaysia now since uh, 2002. Um, we have offices in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Kota Kinabalu, Penang and Johor Bahru. I'm, I'm going to start um, today really talking about COVID-19 and the impact on, on real estate, but more from a, an investor perspective. And then later I'll pass on the baton to young Ken, who heads up our office agency team, and he will be talking, it, talking about it more from a, a landlord and tenant and, and occupier perspective. Um, ben will then follow um, and, and look at it more from a retail perspective. And then we'll end with Kuru, who heads up our commercial and residential property management business. And he'll be looking really at, at the more from the, the property management uh, issues that are, that are arising because of this pandemic. So um, it's fair to say that uh, COVID-19 is, is, is truly a black swan event. Um, and we are in unprecedented um, times. Um, unlike other crises, the effects of, of COVID-19 are being felt on so many different levels. Um, you know, we're seeing on the news, on a day-to-day basis, you know, people are losing their loved ones. Uh, there are widespread uh, job losses and, and cuts in salaries. Uh, businesses are closed. Uh, kids are no longer going to school. Uh, there's widespread uh, remote working uh, happening. There's travel bans, uh, both uh, domestically. I mean, here in Malaysia, we can only travel as far as 10 kilometers from where we live and only for essential trips and also international travel restrictions. Social distancing uh, is now the new normal. Um, lots of businesses are, um, are witnessing is supplier issues um, and there's potential for countries' healthcare systems to be um, completely overwhelmed by such a rapid number of, of, uh, of COVID-19 cases. And then lastly, we're seeing a significant drop in consumer-related demand. So, you know, all of this is happening all, all at the same time, and it's happened so rapidly, um, and it's having such a, a large impact. And it's really unclear at this stage how significant that impact is going to ultimately end up being how long it will last and, and, and what effect that will have on the real estate market. And of course, um, the key, of, the key is, is, of escaping the virus is, is to find this vaccine, which is probably 12 to 18 months away. Um, so even as we come out of the movement control order in this pre-vaccine stage, uh, we, we will be living in a very different world to the one uh, before we entered into this pandemic. 
If we, uh, if we look at China, um, who were the first country to, to be impacted by COVID-19, um, their January and February economic data was, was bad and unprecedented. Um, for the two months combined, the major macro indicators fell by more than 15% year on year. Um, you had things like uh, industrial value added falling by 13.5%, fixed asset investment by 24.5%, and retail sales by 20.5%. Um, and property and auto sales, arguably the two um, biggest economic sectors, uh, fell by more than 40% year on year. Um, so uh, China is, is, is now coming out of their lockdown and is starting its, its road to recovery and, and there are some positive signs that, that we're seeing coming out of China. Um, we're seeing things like um, you know, the data from uh, shows that road congestion, uh, subway use and property sales are beginning to pick up uh, and from talking to uh, colleagues in our Chinese business um, 85% of the retail malls have now reopened and, and business is, is, is returning. So this is it's a really positive, encouraging sign. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how successful China is in controlling the virus now that the, the restrictions have been lifted. Um, and hopefully we won't see a re-emergence of, of COVID-19, which would require a, a, um, you know, a second lockdown. Um, <clears throat> on the whole, I think governments around the world have introduced big, bold and fast policy responses and uh, you know, in, in an attempt to keep businesses afloat and minimise collateral damage. Uh, in Malaysia, you know, we've seen uh, them introduce uh, a number of stimulus packages and I think what's really key is, is how quickly this money can get into the economy to support businesses uh, and um, you know, the people that, that ultimately lose their, their jobs. Um, the, the big question on, on investors' minds is really how long is this going to last for and what sort of, what sort of recession are we going to encounter? Um, is it going to be short and sharp, uh, like a V-shaped recession, or is it going to be sharply down, flat for a while, um, and then a recovery more like a U-shaped, or are we going to experience a hard fall and then stagnation, more like an L-shaped um, depression. And I can really only talk from uh, personal experience and, and from what I read. And um, I, was, I was working in Hong Kong during SARS in 2003, um, and Hong Kong saw, I think, the majority of the, the cases uh, of SARS, about, about a quarter, um, and its, its economy experienced uh, a V-shaped contraction. However, I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic is, is certainly a lot more serious, a lot more hard hitting, and it will overshadow SARS in both, both the number of cases and the, and the global spread. So ultimately, I think a V-shaped recovery is probably looking unlikely. We had the Spanish flu, of course, in 1918, and that lasted for two years and resulted in the deaths of about 50 million people. Um, I, I think that pandemic coincided with the economic fallout from, <clears throat> from World War I as industries uh, <clears throat> adjusted from wartime to peacetime production. So I think of the three scenarios, we're probably looking more like a, a U-shaped recession is probably the most likely outcome. And I suspect um, we will probably experience a combination of the gradual lifting of restrictions as we come out of the movement control order the release of um, pent-up demand from consumers. Um, I mean, we've all spent weeks now indoors. We've really only been, uh, been able to do uh, grocery shopping. <clears throat> so there will be some, some release of pent-up demand. And then we'll see the impact of the stimulus uh, measures initiating an upswing uh, further down the line, I think, in 2021. Of course, um, <clears throat> Malaysia's economy is dependent on the recovery of other, other countries. We, you know, we, we do export a lot of, of goods and services overseas. So how is this all impacting real estate from, from, an, uh, from the sort of investor perspective? Um, firstly, uh, sales volumes have, have fallen. We've seen a, 
a large drop off in, in the volume of real estate transactions. And in the first quarter of this year, uh, volume, sales volumes have fallen 80% year on year, according to data from Real Capital Analytics. And we expect core sales volumes um, to continue in the second quarter due to the movement control, the restrictions under the movement control order. Um, it's not entirely all down to COVID-19. I think, you know, in the first quarter, we saw an unexpected change of the government. And we also saw a drop in the oil prices and both of those um, have, have impacted sentiment. The second item is, you know, during this uncertain period, we are seeing a divergence of views between investors. Um, some investors are wanting to wait until the spread of the virus stabilizes. Some of them, the more conservative ones, are wanting to wait until a vaccine has been found. But there are still plenty of investors who are more opportunistic and they're ready to act to take advantage of any opportunities that may arise as a result of, of reduced competition uh, during this time. Um, the third point I wanted to make is, is there's certainly a preference for uh, longer leased commercial properties. And this, is, this has been a case even before COVID-19, but with the uncertainty, it's definitely, um, uh, you know, there's greater distinction between assets based on length of income. We will see commercial yields rise. Um, there's a high correlation between uh, uh, economic growth or economic contraction and, and performance from real estate. Um, and you know, we do anticipate that there will be uh, reductions in, in rents and investors will put um, much higher allowances for vacancies and uh, the ability to relet space. And that will all put pressure on pricing in the coming months. <clears throat> Although, you know, the impact will vary depending on which market um, you're in in Malaysia. These negatives could be uh, slightly tempered by the offsetting influence of interest rate reductions. And we've seen two, we've seen one in January and one in March. And we could see, so we could see further reductions in the weeks and months ahead. And then really the last point I wanted to make is um, in this uncertain period, we feel that we could see an increase in the, in the number of sale and leasebacks. Um, and this is where you, know, where, you have, where you are, if you are an owner or an occupier of a commercial building, you sell your property and you simultaneously lease it back on a, on a long lease. And the benefit of doing this, of course, is it, it frees up the capital locked in bricks and mortar and it helps you shore up your balance sheet uh, and you can put this money to better use in your core business. Um, it's a it's a win-win situation for both both the the owner occupier and also the the um, the investor um, as he he wants to he wants to buy those kind of assets which are long leased to, to good quality uh, tenants. So that's that's all I wanted to say as much as part of my my discussion. Um, I'll hand over the baton now to Young Ken, who's going to talk a, more from the uh, the occupier side of the market. And we'll have Q and A. Um, at the end of everyone's uh, uh, presentations. Young Ken, over to you. Ah, thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. So for the office occupier market, uh, I'm going to go through the following areas. Uh, the effect of COVID-19 on uh, what is meant for occupier and business, what landlords and tenants should be thinking about and how risk can be mitigated, and then uh, the last brief outlook of the office market. So we know as far as business was concerned, like what James says earlier on has is described, it was not going to be business as usual. So since the MCO took place, um, many of us has been forced to work from home, except the essential services sector. So business are certainly affected as most of us services unable to render or delay, we can't do anything due to the MCO. So for business to continue operation during this period, I think we have a different approach to perform the work. Most of us largely rely on the help of technology. And in terms of business operation, most organization 
uh, have undertaken immediate action to first protect the safety and well-being of their employees, customers, business partners, and workplace. The thing is, it's important to give confidence that the office or the workplace is safe to convene meetings and to carry out the day-to-day -day business. I think measures that we have seen or most of you have seen uh, in most organizations have adopted strict hygiene measures at the facility, encourage people to sanitize at all time, wash their hands with soap, wear masks as possible, avoid handshake, temperature check, discourage large group meetings and events. Some like they're having like up to six per meeting or eight people per meeting just to avoid a big group meeting. Altering travel policies, limit overseas traveling, and if really required, then quarantine upon return. So, and also employees that may have been exposed to the virus, just stay at home. No need to go to the office. I think those that the safety and the well being, those sort of policies that measures that has seen most business occupy already proactively uh, undertaken. And of course, now, secondly, not only the safety to weather through the after effect of COVID 19. Uh, most businesses will be looking at cost-cutting measures to preserve cash and ensure business continuity. Hence, many organizations may not be keen to start on any big-ticket items and to keep expenses low. So for office occupier, it will mean possible delay or cancellations of any project or even a new approach in the office space planning. So with this COVID crisis, what should landlord and tenant be thinking about and how risk can be mitigated? I think um, for landlord is concerned, uh, top priority would be to have a strict hygiene measure in place when tenant returns back to office. This is so important to instill tenant confidence at the building and also their workplace. Uh, my senior partner, Kuru, uh, will touch on this more. I think for landlord also, I, as part of the tenant retention strategy to retain their tenant and also to attract new tenant in their building, landlord should perhaps consider to further equip the building with facility that promotes safety and wellness that can provide good experience to their occupier. For example, like installation of UV lights that can kill germs, a good air ventilations and filtration system that promote cleaner air, uh, sensors, soap dispenser, sensors for door sensors, toilet flush, those already have, but it's basically avoiding people to, to touch, you know, uh, 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 touch anything. Uh, even though like things that the usage of uh, 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 leaf uh, via mobile apps or QR code to the dedicated floor. I mean, there are more Which, things that can give good building experience and that can instill tenant satisfaction and confidence. So moving forward, landlords measures and efforts in promoting this wellness building concepts will likely to be one of the important evaluation criteria for prospective tenant when making a real estate decision. So you know, tenants make decision, the usual criteria close to public transportation, close to food, amenities, uh, building specs. I think this is going forward to be one of the most important, one of the important evaluation criteria when they decided on the, on the leasing uh, decision. So landlord who are proactive and forward thinking will likely to retain and attract more tenants. So as far as tenants, um, beside cost cutting, staying agile and nimble, think seeking flexibility in the tenancy agreement, tenancy terms to allow contraction, expansion, cost expansion be optimities at this time going forward we looked at, but as an end require will be something very important. The topic of force major keeps coming up 
but in reality, these clauses generally doesn't cover for this pandemic event. I think going forward, we expect tenants trying to amend this to try to limit their risk and exposure. I mean, we are, we are helping some of our occupiers to guide them through and to facilitate a smooth conversation with landlord this time. And also we do help tenants uh, talking about their upcoming renewal to look at negotiating certain flexibility terms so they can stay agile in future. But what I would like to say, um, I think we are all in a very this challenging time, especially this moment, we hope that tenants and landlord can empathize with each other. I mean, as badly affected as tenants have been, their landlords are also in this uncharted territory. Even though legally there may be no obligation for landlords to give waiver or discount, they could consider offering some relief on a case by case basis, especially if there is tenant long term relationship and they also have been a prompt pay master throughout the duration of the tenancy. I think some landlord could consider giving up some of their income in the short term to benefit both in the long run. So what would be the market outlook in the coming years? I mean, like for office sector here, everyone knows even before the disruptions of this COVID-19, the oversupply of office space has been growing, exerting pressure on rents in the past years. So average grade A and prime A plus rents in KL as of end of 2019 is about averaging seven ringgit 40 cents a square foot with occupancy in the region of 75%. From 2015 to 2019, this grade A and prime A rents has been softening gradually to about 5%. And with the forthcoming supply of approximately 3 million scheduled to be completed, especially in the KL city by year end, uh, coupled with the COVID crisis and also the fluctuations and low oil and gas price, and this certainly uh, cost lower leasing activities. Uh, rents will certainly be under pressure further. And to what extent and quantum of the decrease is really hard to predict. I would like to share some facts that I managed to obtain from my research department uh, based on the NAPIC National uh, Property Information Center. Back in 97 crisis and to 98, rents in Golden Triangle has dropped about 15%. So COVID-19, I think it will be a near-term challenge for all of us. But the trend of changing work habits, working from home, working re remotely, will likely to accelerate further. But we feel in a strong opinion that it is not the death of the office. Office will still be vital for placemaking, socializing, innovation, getting major decision approved, etc. And I don't think many of us would like to stuck at home and work from home all this time. I also think that a trend of a company has a central office and multiple satellite office. It could be co-working, it could be a smaller office suites, some of the subletting space, so for staff to work from. I mean, given technology, infrastructure, and bandwidth connectivity in, is largely reliable in Malaysia, this could be some fresh consideration by certain organization. And of course, this was also prompt increased budget in technology investment. I think also, now the government incentive on rental discount and waiver for SME uh, that always keeps seeing popping up uh, retail premises by GLCs on tax deduction also available for private landlord to their SME tenants provided a private landlord opt for it for the three months. I think these are temporary relief measures 
with lower leasing activity expected. I think it's timely and government should consider providing more incentive, such as those moratorium on quick rent assessment and stamp duty in the second half, aiming to encourage more leasing activity. Well, I think co-working space will continue to be relevant and important, despite now they are suffering from the loss of income during MCO, and perhaps right after MCO, it will pick up, but still probably low. But going forward, they should be doing well. What we know of uh, during this time, we also have increased inquiry and we're aware of some certain organization already negotiating co-working space as one of their additional satellite office, ensuring business continuity should there be incident of COVID happen in the main office. I am of also of the view that office space are cheaper compared to our regional peers countries. Uh, in fact, I would say one of the cheapest in APEC. We do not seek like a packed light sardines office situation here. With companies in the region and globally now looking at cost efficiency and business continuity, we believe shared service operation will continue to grow as more companies are considering to embark on shared services, offshoring, outsourcing of the non-core work. So that's, that's from my part on the office uh, sector side. So I'd like to hand over this to Ben Ui, where he will walk through you guys on the retail occupier market. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, so, uh, Yang Ken. I'll be uh, having uh, three pointers today. Uh, we'll be talking about <coughs> how are malls taking the initiative during the MCO period. Uh, number two is um, how is the retailers being impacted by the low sales? And so business during the MCO and the COVID after the COVID-19 outbreak. What can a mall and landlord retailers do? And the last one I'll be pointing out will be how would malls attract visitors come back after the MCO? So as you can see, this is How the malls taking the in Aeon, uh, they're taking it, uh, but wait, can't come to the mall. Still, buy your poster. Um, the other colors of Aeon Big, they are also practicing, uh, Right through as well, but you uh, it's sort of selected uh, outlet. So everyone is doing personal shopping and also right through outlet. Uh, the other initiatives that we have seen from uh, Mydin is that they have gone a step further by providing virus, my uh, virus nano spray buster, where you, you know, disinfect the whole entire setup with the trolley before you go into check-in. Uh, this is to give customers a piece of fine or you shop. This is at uh, USJ Alert. Uh, other than that, other landmarks have taken extra precaution during the MCO by minimizing the access so that no checkout points uh, can screen people coming in and out. And cleaners are doing the uh, different cleaning and sanitizing uh, during this uh, period extra. So, uh, having said that, how does the, the question is the retailers, how are they really impacted by the low sales and so on business during the MCO? Um, as you know, in challenging time, uh, everyone knows that uh, the landlord uh, and the tenants have to take a long-term uh, relations, you know, coming over come this. It cannot be a one-sided thing, so it has to be a win-win situation for both parties. Uh, so therefore, any form of assistance would be good. You know, providing like rental rebates, as you can see, the red and the papers already, uh, some landlords are providing rental rebates. 
uh, more owners uh, you know, have to talk with the retailers you know, to create a win-win situation rather than you know, not uh, existing law. I guess uh, this will be a discussion further on with uh, malls and retailers. Uh, as you can see, so the FB sectors uh, they're taking the initiative by doing a lot of food delivery now. Uh, prep food, as you can see, has been increased. Food panda and also has been increased. Uh, the initiative by some retailers are in the life. As you can see, they have already done uh, the instead of usually you go and buy a bubble tea now, instead you can't buy a bubble tea, they've done it by doing a uh, and they teach you how to do a bubble tea at home. So there's some initiative in that. Uh, burger Lab uh, is also famous where you have your burger, but you find it now. So what they've done is that they have done the, uh, you can buy all online, a pet in on, they teach you how to cook it at home. So there's some initiative from them. Um, the, there's an increase you know, from data uh, papers, you can see. 45% of food delivery has been increased and then uh, there are additional food delivery been set up you know, like uh, Bips delivery. Uh, food panda also saw an increase of the uh, opportunity by 7.5%. Um, then the other one is Grab. Uh, as you see the drivers, uh, they can do the uh, normal e hailing taxis. So they have been diverted to doing uh, uh, delivery as well. So there's some initiatives from you know, people supporting each other. That's why we call this uh, bin bin. Um, there's also some associations, uh, FMBs, they are creating their own associations. Recently there's been uh, in papers that the uh, 400 FMB uh, outlets that they have created their own association. They call it themselves the Malaysian Operation Alliance. And they have been appealing uh, to ensure the continuity. And, you know, they've been talking with landlords and uh, retailers about well, how to continue their business, maintain staff after the MCO. Um, Twenty percent of them are only able to operate, and the fifty percent are only partially open, while thirty percent are still closed during the MCO. Why are they, some of them are, they cannot operate like, you know, for instance, boat noodle, they are for instance, is, uh, uh, they can't do delivery, so they are totally closed and they have no sales. Um, apart from that, the REN, you know, like Yankee was saying, the REN moratorium and Alliance is seeking, you know, some further reductions, uh, rent reductions from the MCU period to the landlord after the MCU period for another maybe like six months, you know, they are suggesting that. Um, from that, uh, the MRCA Association, uh, Malaysian Retail Association, they are also uh, taking the initiative by supporting the FB by you know, posting their flyers in their Facebook to have awareness to the shoppers that you know they are still around. They, uh, they even have. Uh, so after all this having said that what will be the uh, track how do we gonna attract back the shoppers back after MCO? As you can see, the same malls like in Wuhan, they started to open back, but uh, they are still slowly coming back. Uh, sentiment is still, you know, people are still afraid to go out and eat. Uh, Wuhan uh, has an optic value, you know, they have about 1,000 uh, companies there. And only 20% of that has been, uh, office people has been started to work because uh, China still has the you know, restriction of the uh, movement. So uh, we are expecting business to pick up during the third quarter or fourth quarter from the news that we're getting in China. Um, online presence, you know, online presence is a key now for 
come to survive. So, uh, for instance, uh, I've heard that even beauty sectors, uh, how they do it is that you, know, you can't go into your salon now, you can't even do, you can't do many things. So, what they're doing is that uh, they have done the initiative by uh, send, you know, send, you, send you a makeup kit and then uh, the housewife will afford and purchase the makeup kit of people who want to you know, do some. Relief, stress relief during this lockdown. They will do a one to one Zoom call like they're doing. That's what some of the sectors are uh, initiated to, to boost up their sales because it's important now. Cash flow. So you know, there's some form of uh, cash flow that they can uh, get. They post, you know, post MCO period, uh, I will guess the brick and mortar business. To see his wife, but uh, because uh, as you know, everyone still would like to go to a shopping mall uh, to test their clothes, wear clothes, you know, wear shoes rather than just shopping online. But uh, having said that, so it has to be a uh, innovative uh, moment now where retailers has to go online and um, provide an online presence ever more. So that's what you know, the beauty industry that I've heard they're doing now. Uh, and so, you know, Lazada, they, what they have done is uh, they have even helped the Cameroon farmers by providing a website to sell their Cameroon fresh produce from Lazada's website. You can order vegetables from Lazada. If Lazada, as you know, always be ordering your hand phones your, and all the stuff, but you have never expected Lazada to produce uh, even uh, help the Cameron people to set the measure. Uh, Shopee has also even taken the, the step to do that. They are doing uh, fresh with uh, no, fish, fishermen, they're helping fishermen to do their uh, sale during uh, rural areas. So they're testing this out and it's, you know, and time value and uh, we integrated the time value. So maybe you can support. This is fishermen uh, by like, checking out the Lazada you know, Shopee's website or Lazada to get some fresh vegetables. Uh, having said that, there's still opportunity around. You know, there's, uh, there's no like no opportunity. Every challenge is there's opportunity. So some retailers, uh, they are still doing expansion mode, and now is a good time that they can have. Uh, you know, discuss with the landlord for a better rate and maybe they have uh, now they can't get into a regional mall but with this chance you know for the expansion they want their bread prices they can have a better negotiation with landlords now where you know they can have opportunity to be presented in a regional mall where last time they could not um, uh, during this MCA as well uh, after the MCO as well, the landlords have to work closely with the advertising and promotion you know, to attract back customers. End of the day, it's the trust that uh, the, the shopping malls would show to the shoppers to gain back the trust to go back to the shopping. Uh, it will take time, but uh, as long as there's a commitment by the landlord and the retailers to Work together during and after this period well, uh, by you know, promoting give presence online free uh, advertising and other things that would be uh, some things that everyone should look at at this moment now you know um, during the SARS crisis there uh, was three periods of uh, you know in China or you know, in you know, some parts of the world that have affected SARS there was a shock and then a recovery and a stabilization. So during the SARS, you know, like you said, uh, was in early May, uh, it bounced back by July, it stabilized somewhere, stabilized back in July. So during that period, you know, uh, baby food and fresh food has seen spikes in sales uh, during the panic buying. 
and this correctly, as you know, the end bank was dollar rule, so I don't know why uh, came out with this dollar rule thing. But having said that, um, the most important now is uh, to stay safe, stay strong, and stay positive. I will pass to my colleague, Mr. Puru, for his uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ben. I hope uh, everyone is uh, able to hear me uh, and I won't take uh, much of the time. Uh, very good morning to uh, ladies and gentlemen who are listening to this webinar. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I have the least sexiest, sexiest area of real estate to share on. Uh, however, I believe it is one of the most important one. Uh, effective property management is crucial for businesses to operate during and after this movement control order or MCO as it's uh, very commonly termed. As James mentioned, we are actually in unprecedented times and many of us are in new territory in terms of what we need to do uh, in times like this. It's a very unfamiliar period for many of us and even in the property management, for property management professionals, our existing SOPs and policies and procedures couldn't really uh, prepare us for such a time. We had to put on our thinking hats again. But nevertheless, as property managers, uh, our clients, our tenants, occupiers, vendors, and members of the public, visitors who come to our building depend on us to make and take certain measures to mitigate this problem in the best way that we can. Anticipating that this pandemic, uh, obviously we're all reading the news and listening to the news, uh, was coming to our shores. Uh, the property management team of Knight Frank quickly got our act together and with advice uh, from the medical experts, the government and with the support of our clients and our in-house safety uh, teams, health and safety teams, we began our mitigating measures. This included, but not limited to taking temperature checks, sanitizing of all our building assets, uh, advising people to constantly and regularly wash and sanitize their hands, uh, wearing of face masks, refraining from touching their face, and as well as to practicing uh, social distancing. And uh, these were all communicated through notices and through social media that, uh, that uh, has been sent out to all tenants and occupiers. It is uh, no doubt that ensure, ensuring the safety in a building is a big task, as we can only control what really is in the common area of the building as property managers. And it was up to the tenants and occupiers to practice and take heed of the advice given to them within their premises. And Young can touch that, touch upon that, that occupiers themselves were taking some measures. And I'm, I'm glad even a lot of our tenants have uh, done the same. Safety and health is everyone's responsibility. It's not just left to the government or to the medical experts. It's all our responsibility. And to ensure this, it requires all stakeholders to cooperate and take heed of good safety and health practices. As property managers, there's an expectation to provide and maintain the building in a safe, healthy, and conducive environment for tenants and occupiers, as well as visitors uh, who come to the building. I'm glad to say that to date, that in all the buildings managed by us, we've had relatively good success, success in containing the situation even after the MCO came into force on 18th of March. To date, only a handful of tenant staff have contracted the virus whilst in the building. However, the source of this infection was mainly from staff who returned from overseas or who were part of a cluster, cluster, cluster uh, prior to the MCO. All these staff, I'm glad to say, were treated and we have been advised that most of them have since been discharged. Once the MCO uh, came into force and whilst all essential services tenants continued to operate within our buildings, all tenants in non-essential services shut down their offices. So we've had to obviously work with different levels of occupancy in the building and that gave us an opportunity to obviously shut down some of our facilities as well. Our site team who have been trained and briefed on what to do during these times were placed on rotation in two teams and working either on alternate days or alternate weeks to also look after their safety and their health and well-being. These safety measures and health measures were in place even prior to the MCO and continues, continues through the MCO P 
period, and I believe will also continue post MCO until such time we are assured that this virus is been totally eradicated. Unfortunately, no one knows how long this will be or when this will be. So what should we as property managers now prepare for, get ready for? We are currently focusing on preparing the buildings to welcome the tenants back to the offices once the MCO is lifted to provide a safe and healthy environment for them to carry out their business. We will also look to have strict uh, visitor entry regimes in place to protect the buildings and its occupiers. For Knight Frank, this exercise is not just a local effort, but an international one. We're doing this entire returning to office uh, SOP with all the Knight Frank global offices throughout the world to come up with a standard which is of international class. There will definitely be a new normal that landlords and tenants property managers and vendors would have to get used to. Young Ken did mention that tenants will be looking for greater safety and health measures. And he did mention some of the measures they'd be looking at. Uh, and this will primarily be uh, looking at non-physical contact uh, usage of the facilities, such as sensors, facial recognition, usage of QR code, et cetera. And these are all the things that we, is right now in consideration. Finally, whilst we see some light at the end of the tunnel in Malaysia, however, no one knows if this MCO will be extended or lifted come 28 April. But whatever it is, the property managers will have to be prepared with the top priority being the health and safety of our occupants, our vendors, our, our site team, and the tenants. Thank you very much. I'll now pass on this time to our moderator, Ms. Celine Su, to moderate the Q&A sessions I know Many of you have questions and answers, so I want to just give time for all of you to be able to ask your questions. Over to you, Celine. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Celine here, and uh, we received a few questions. Some of them are quite similar, so um, I'm just going to group them together and then get our panelists to answer it. Okay, one of the questions, um, which is, I think Kuru maybe could answer, um, they are asking how could landlord recover from a potential loss in income due to rental rebates given to given to tenant during the MCO? Right, Celine. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much we can uh, do to help them recover the loss, but as property managers uh, for landlords, we should look at ways to review and reduce building operation expenses. Uh, obviously, when they're getting less revenue, we don't want to uh, obviously have uh, very high operating expenses. And we can do this by reviewing some of the service contracts, looking at possible greater energy saving measures, uh, retiming some of the m and &E operations, exploring works that can be done more by the in-house team as opposed to uh, outsourcing to third party, uh, probably even delaying some major repair works or capex until such time where it's absolutely necessary. Times like maybe if it affects health and safety or it enhances re revenue generation. So. For us as property managers, I think that's where we will focus quite a lot of our efforts, which we have already started looking at in how we can start uh, to uh, reduce cost uh, and make operations more efficient. Okay, uh, there are a few questions that are quite similar. Um, some are asking post COVID-19, some are asking currently actually, they are very interested to know uh, what type of real estate class are starting to look more attractive, you know, uh, with this pandemic or which property sector do you think will weather the crisis the best? So um, maybe James can, can take this. Okay, let's just... So I have to unmute myself. Um, I think in terms of weathering the crisis the best, it's probably going to be logistics and warehousing. Um, the property fundamentals in that sector are very supportive. There's, there's limited new supply, and um, particularly now, you know, warehousing is 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 really a, a quite a, an essential infrastructure for the economy. Um, you know, you've got the, the growth of online retailing um, that's going to support demand for more retail space. And we've seen around the world, you know, there's been supplier issues. Um, shortages of PPE and drugs and I think we will see countries trying to encourage reshoring of certain manufacturing, important manufacturing um, 
parts of, of, of the economy back to back to the countries and that, that will also avoid demand for industrial property. So that that's that sector is likely to weather the storm the best, but will you see the lowest prices in that sector? Will you see the biggest price correction in that sector? I, I don't think so. I think logically you will find uh, more, more sort of um, price reductions in um, you know, sectors which, you know, sectors such as hospitality and retail where, um, you know, a lot hinges on, on um, um, consumer consumer related demand so that those are the sort of the two areas that, that I think if you're if you're looking looking for for better buys perhaps you should focus on those areas okay thanks James um, there is a question on retail uh, and this is talking about post MCO because we know that the retail is hit very hard during this global pandemic and um, Many are worried and um, asking how the malls are going to attract visitors to come back after MCO. So maybe Ben can help a little on this. Ben, just need to unmute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so I was, sorry, this time the line wasn't so clear. I was uh, just saying that uh, after this post MCO and, uh, you know, Online presence uh, now, uh, there's some sectors they are taking the initiative, uh, like the beauty sectors, instead of uh, their, their brick and mortar, they have taken initiative by doing a makeup kit and you can use that makeup, you, uh, ladies or you know, who, who, who want some makeup, they, they, have, uh, they you can send, they can send this makeup kit to the house and they can do a Zoom one to Zoom one call like what we're doing now. And they can teach you, you know, you want to do a stress relief, you can stress relief. You can do a makeup online, one to one. They will teach you how to do a nice makeup to your face if you, you know, would like to have that. That is what the beauty sectors they are doing. Um, also, the uh, shopping online, the like Lazada and Shopee, they've taken the initiative uh, by helping the Cameron farmers you can even buy vegetable now from Lazada and Shopee has done step further by supporting the fishermen. Uh, for example, in the, I heard this recently in Pontian, Johor, they have uh, done uh, online, you can buy fishes fresh from the Pontian, uh, from their Shopee online store. Um, as you can see also, opportunities uh, are still there for retailers who want to do expansion. Uh, we have noted that uh, some retailers, they want to do expansion and they are, given, they are given out opportunities to be represented in regional malls. Uh, previously, they could not be represented in regional malls. But uh, now I would guess rentals are low and they have uh, better negotiation with the landlords to be present in the regional malls. You know, there are still opportunities there for retailers who are doing expansion. Um, I would like to say as well that uh, after this post MCO, malls and uh, landlords, uh, retailers, they will need to do a lot of uh, create the trust back. You know, uh, there's still a lot of fear after the post MCO that uh, people want to go. So uh, advertising and online presence, it's a very good uh, now opportunity for everyone to we uh, create a presence, uh, you know, like the Malaysian Retail Association. They have uh, given a, their Facebook to create your branding and online presence now, so that people still remember you after the MCO period. That I think that you can take this chance to you know create a, a branding that people know you're still around after the post MCO. Uh, lastly, you know, during the SARS period, uh, in some countries that are affected, there were three uh, period. They were called the shock, recovery, and stabilization period. And um, as you know, SARS was in early, they, they started to stop in early May, like James said, in May 2003. Um, it stabilized in July 2003. So uh, during that period, baby food and uh, fresh food was spiked. As you can see, during this COVID-19 was toilet rolls. So I don't know what uh, it's that, but so, in the end of the day, uh, during post-MCO uh, period, you have to have uh, 
online presence, uh, but still people, they want to do brick and mortar. So it has to be gelled with both now. So I would like just to end with uh, stay safe, stay strong, and stay positive. Thank you, Celine. Okay, uh, we have another question. Maybe Yang can take this um, because some people are asking to what degree are private landlords providing rental relief to their tenants, like based on your experience on the landlords you have worked with, you know, what until what degree they are providing rental relief to their tenants who are suffering right now? Yeah, thank you. I, I saw even questions say, are uh, there firm directive from Malaysian government on rebate implementation for building owners of private sector? Uh, firm directive, uh, no, landlord is not obligated. What our Prime Minister has mentioned is on the principle of burden sharing. They are encouraged, not compulsory, to do so. Uh, of course, if they opt to do so, they are entitled for the three months uh, equivalent of tax uh, deductions. So for 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 in in connection to this, this is really boiled down to private landlords, uh, building owners, uh, their own prerogative, how they want to give it to their tenants. Uh, we have dealt with many landlords, and I know uh, there are landlords uh, that I can say uh, that that we that we that we we have got a. Uh, consent, <laughs> they, 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 Menara Binjai, for example, they themselves uh, already uh, take initiative steps, giving up 50% uh, of rental rebate on the base rent uh, for all their tenants for this MCO period. So again, it's, 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 um, um, these are what we have seen, uh, that private landlord that uh, some have undertook and some that we have spoke to, uh, a lot have not come to a decision, but I think some have come to a consideration, great considerations, uh, to to try to give something back to their tenant. Uh, they they do understand that a lot of all their tenants they have been are all been together with them for a period of time, been good prom master. Uh, I, I believe uh, there are kind landlords out there who consider to do so. Okay. Okay. So maybe we can probably take out the last question because we have like five minutes left. Um, the last question is because all of us know that um, the government are, you know, giving up, coming up with initiative, different measures to help uh, landlords or even tenants, you know, helping to, to make this economy better. Um, so, but we may have other wish lists or, you know, what, what we would like to say, uh, maybe you could share what you would suggest, you know, government or state governments could come up with to help this situation right now. Um, maybe, Yang Ken, you want to start first if you have any, you know, wish list in mind. Well, I think <laughs> my, my, earlier wish list, uh, my earlier wish list that I mentioned, uh, this, this uh, rental uh, rebate uh, incentive under the pre hatin stimulus package, uh, those uh, are temporary measures. Uh, it will be good that really uh, timely to government to look at this uh, quick rent moratorium and quick rent assessment. I mean, this moratorium and quick rent assessment really will help to take off pressures from landlord knowing that they are not uh, required to pay. In return, landlord will be even motivated to even give more incentives to their tenant. Hopefully, can actually strike a deal. And also stamp duty, I think tenants paying stamp duties uh, may not be a big sum compared to the uh, potential capex cost, but again, it's still a, a, a money that can help uh, to arrive in a leasing decision. So I think that would be the wish list uh, uh, from, from, from uh, the office market side. Okay. Uh, ben, you have anything to add on? Yeah, I guess... Uh... The, for the SMEs, for the retail side, uh, the government has given the initiative of the extra loan and all the thing. But I guess feedback is that paperwork, paperwork is really a hindrance to them. And uh, you know, the time now is of the essence. So I guess if the government can reduce the paperwork and just just have one body, like you know, like maybe Bank Nagara, just to have the like, say that you know, like now with previously the loans all. They just one shot give 
to six months by the bank, Nagara, you don't have to any every bank will go and wet through. So now uh, retailers they are they are saying that they're a bit frustrated with the paperwork, uh, all this. So I guess if the government can reduce the paperwork for this, then there will be a better cash flow, you know, and advance faster for these SMEs to help them through this period. Okay. All right. Um, I think our time is almost up. Thank you for, um, thank you for our, uh, our panelists here sharing today. I hope everyone find this session insightful. Um, I'm going to pass back to uh, Jennifer from BMCC. Thanks for having us, Mike Frank, here today. Jennifer? Thank you, Celine. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Um, good insights. Uh, just to summarize a few takeaways. I mean, uh, James, uh, who is the ED for Capital Markets, uh, spoke about, you know, uh, investor perspective. And this is probably the good time for investors to consider if we want to invest, um, you know, the opportunities that are available, looking beyond the challenges that everyone is facing now. Um, then moving on to Young Ken, Young Ken was very clear on what landlords and tenants need to do. You know, for us tenants, it will be a good time to take this, you know, period to assess, you know, what the landlords are doing and looking at, you know, the, and this will be an important criteria when in the fall future, yeah, everything we are looking, you know, regarding the long term. So Young Ken, thank you so much. And then moving on to Ben, I guess the message that all of us um, would get apologies to all the participants for a bit of uh, IT issue during that time, but one of the key message will be businesses are, you know, becoming more innovative in terms of, um, you, know, you know, trying to survive. So, and then uh, Kuru uh, managed to you know, end up saying property managers how to look at it. I think the message, one of the key messages is how landlords and tenants, I mean, landlords and property markets behave today is very important decision makers for Continue to engage with your landlords, those who are tenants and those landlords. I think I hope you appreciate some of the key points today. Once again, on behalf of Knight Frank, thank you to the Knight Frank team for uh, facilitating today's uh, webinar. And to all the participants, thank you so much for tuning in. We have um, next week, watch out for two more webinars. On the 21st, we have an economic outlook with the World Bank. Hope to see you all again. And followed that on the 27th of April, we have uh, one on managing contractual obligations. So thank you very much for now. Uh, take care, stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.